Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to Wayne State Graduate School's professional development series. This week, we have a, a great event and one that we have been um, preparing for and, and excited to have on the schedule for a while. And this is our, our first conflict management session uh, with Dr. Laura Lee Kishley. She, is, uh, she has spoken at our events in the past, um, and she is um, she's graciously returned to speak to all of you today. Uh, my name is Nick Matar, and I am the Director of Marketing at the Graduate School. Um, before we get started, just a couple of really quick notes. Um, first off, we, uh, when this, this afternoon we emailed out a couple of documents um, along with the Zoom link. Um, so Laura Lee may uh, allude to those throughout the session. And also this is being recorded. So we will be sharing the, uh, the video file uh, on YouTube afterwards, uh, hopefully in the next couple of days, ideally tomorrow, um, but possibly Thursday as well, kind of depending on timing. Um, we'll also be sure to share the slides in that email as well. Um, and be sure to uh, take our survey. We, we really do value the post-event surveys and what you all have to say, and, and I will say for all of you who have attended our events in the past, over the past two months, um, we've really valued the feedback that we've gotten so far. We, we look at those each week in our meetings. So um, please be sure to do that, do that. And I'll mention this again at the end of the session today. Um, but uh, the last little bit of housekeeping, uh, this is the first in a two-part series of events. Um, there will be a part two coming up. I believe that's not until March. Um, sure. Next week, we'll be hosting an event uh, for all you doctoral students out there on preparing your IDP. Um, that is going to be a, uh, a very informational session that will help the graduate student experience for you. Um, and then in the second week of March, uh, we're going to be we're going to have our graduate research symposium, an entirely virtual three day event. That's really the grad school's flagship event of the year. Uh, we have, we'll have 180 something researchers presenting their, their work. And we usually have uh, attendees from four or five continents and uh, a couple dozen countries. And, and I think this year we already have uh, close to 50 universities represented from around the world. So we have a great global diverse audience here uh, with us in March. But, um, you know, that. I digress there. I, I don't want to take any more time away from Loralee. So without further ado, um, Loralee, please uh, feel free to take it away. Great. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Mary. And hello, everybody. It's, it's good to see at least some of you. Many of you know when you share your screen in Zoom, you only get to see a snippet. I do have the chat open, so I'm also going to try to monitor that. And Matt and uh, and Nick and Mary, I'm going to ask you to help me with the time because it seems like my timer has decided it doesn't want to work. So, you know, give me a high sign at about quarter two um, to let me know. So conflict, we're going to talk about conflict management here and how we're going to do that. And we've truthfully, we got less than an hour, right? And so I'm not what I'm going to talk about and share with you and have you think about is um, is an introduction, right? It's a taste. Um, and so in terms of will it solve everything you got going on? No, but perhaps what it'll do is give you some ways of thinking about conflicts and how you approach them and how you work with others and yourself in a conflict so that you can start to feel like you have, you feel more confident about your ability to deal with that. And conflict is a very common thing common experience for people. Um, it doesn't have to be destructive. There's nothing inherent in most conflicts that say they should be destructive. So we have a lot of influence in terms of how they proceed based on how we, how we engage with it. So that's, I'm going to give you some ideas to think about, some strategies to talk about. So how am I going to do that? I'm going to, we're going to talk about what is conflict. Okay, this is this is not always good when your own system won't let you do something. Oh, fiddle dee dee. There we go. Let's try that. Nope. Well, that's frustrating. Hold on. All right, now it does it. Um, give you a model of responding. Um, have a bit of conversation about sources of conflict. Um, not all conflicts are the same. 
and getting some clarity about what the source of a conflict might be can be helpful to you in thinking about how you want to engage and how you want to address it. And I'm going to use a model called the core skills model. So it breaks it down for you because sometimes the stuff you see, you go, okay, so they want me to talk directly to somebody. Well, how do I do that? Especially if they're really mad or especially if I'm really mad, how do we do that? We break it down into some a core set of skills. And then I'll finish up just by saying, you know, some conflicts we have um, aren't really necessary. We didn't need to have them. And that had we set some expectations for our work together or for our relationship together, um, and we had some agreeable expectations about that, many of the conflicts that we've experienced wouldn't happen. So what I'm going to have you do, we're going to do a Mentimeter. And so I would like you to, is this going to do it? Oh, that's interesting. Hang on just a sec, you guys. All right. Now let me do this again, because it's going to give me a hard time. <laughs> Hold on. Let me do this again. See, this is where I show you that as an administrator, I've been out of the classroom for a couple of years. And so all my sophistication that I could have had <laughs> has not developed as fast as possible. So here's what I'd like you to do. Um, go to menti.com and use the code that you see there, um, 11464753. And what I'd like you to do is to answer these, these questions, they're together. They're the same kind of a question. Like what, what do you consider, when do you consider yourself to be in a conflict? Like, how do you know uh, what's going on for your body? What's going on for your mind? What's happening outside? Like, what are your signs that you are in conflict? And so if you go to Menti and you can just type in a few words and they're gonna pop up, uh, they're anonymous. So they're not gonna identify who submitted them. Um, and uh, we'll take a look at that. And then I'll take some of that content and weave it into other, into other pieces. So let's take a couple of minutes on this one. Hey, Loralee, could you yeah. put the uh, link in the chat? Oh, you are asking me to do complicated stuff, man. Just hold on. <laughs> let's see if I can do it. And if I can, I'd like the, come on. Oh, rats, chat's not good. Oh, here we go. Nope, come on. It's not letting me do it, Nick. If this is the link at the bottom. Um... Yeah, it's the, on the bottom of the um, a slide. That's, that's the, that should be the main link to go to. Uh, I'll put, I'll, Could you I'll, do that uh, for me? I'll Thank put you, that Nick. into the, oh, Thank looks you. like somebody oh. beat me to it. Oh, Christina, yay, Christina. Shared leadership responsibilities. We're a group and uh, we help each other out. And that's one of the, so thank you so much, Christine. I really appreciate it. Okay, so hopefully folks are gonna be able to start putting in a few, you know, again, your first kind of reaction when you saw that, how do you know when you're in a conflict? What are the signs that tell you you're in a conflict? Hey guys, is this working? It looks like, oh, that's, that's the link for the setup. Oh, dear, 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 dear. Can you go to menti.com? Michelle, can you go to menti.com? And then it'll, uh, it'll ask you for the code. Yeah, the code is right at the top of the page here. Um, you should be able to see it on my screen. Can you? It's uh, 1146. Four seven five three. That mentimeter.com. Oh yeah, no, it's called menti.com, and then it'll pop up, and you put the code in. You know what's going on here, guys? Hold on a sec. I may have to. Okay, you don't see it on your screen. Thanks. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to stop sharing, and then I'm going to go here, and then I'm going to share again. All right, let me share again, and then this time. I just got to remember to, oh, fiddle dee dee, what's it doing? There we go. Okay, is it working now? 
Can you see it? Great, I can see it. Can other people see it now, Mary? Yep, we can yes. see it on the link. We still need a code though to get in. Yes, and it's right at the top. If, if I shared my screen appropriately, you should see the code right at the top. It says go to menti.com and use the code. Perfect, thanks. Okay. You guys are great. Thank you so much. And what you're demonstrating is one of the core attitudes in dealing with conflict, which is about patience and grace. Um, so I appreciate that. Thank you. So we're seeing so okay. Frustration, disagreement, inability. So yeah, feeling stuck. When your tone, when the tone of voice changes, when your body changes, body language changes. Sure. In what ways might body language change? Do you find yourself becoming tense? Do you find your, uh, parts of your body starting to ache? Because the body will often display for you when it feels like it's under stress, which when conflict is happening, people feel often feel stressed. Rise in blood pressure, getting loud, so the sound of the interaction changes. Yep, body temperature, right? Let's see what else we got. Sometimes people stop communicating, true. Um, I feel I'm in conflict. Discuss with a person, disagreement, when the relationship somehow makes a shift. Yeah, yeah, really great. Let's just do another couple of sec, uh, another few seconds, and then I'll unshare this and share back my other screen. So yeah, you guys are tapping into some rapid heartbeats. So we see a lot of physiological breakdown in communication, um, maybe become sweaty, really warm. Um, yeah, the kinds of communication happening becomes disrespectful. It changes in its quality. Um, when you're bothered, you become angry and stressed, being closed off. Yeah, you find maybe that your own willingness to be flexible and open starts to close down. That's true. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop there right now. I have to stop this share, and then I have to do another share. Those of you who are more sophisticated than I am are going, Lorely, truthfully, you can do that without having to do that. Okay, now we're back on track. All right, thanks. I mean, I think um, you all described um, what you were experiencing and that, and what you're talking about are what we call the different dimensions of, of conflict when conflict first appears. So there's the cognitive piece to it, the perceptions, so that is things like, okay, come on now, you got to cooperate with me. Um, perception, like your ideas, your beliefs, your needs, your wants, your interests are incompatible with somebody else. Like you get this sense about, ooh, what they want and what I want. Like, how is that possible? Uh, the emotional part and a number of the comments you made talked about the emotions of it. Often conflicts accompanied by things like anxiety, fear, sadness, hopelessness, if it's a very escalated conflict, or if you've had the old zero to 60 phenomenon, where you, things seem to be going, and then the next thing you know, it feels like it's gone off the rails, and you're like, oh my gosh, what just happened here? Um, and then the behavioral, the action part, uh, what people do to take those cognitions, those feelings, and those feelings uh, to get their needs met, and they can, do, and will do it in a way that has the potential to interfere with the other person getting their needs met. And the reason I like to talk about briefly about these things is, is if you want to, my goodness, if you want to manage conflict, you're gonna to have to hit all three of these. All of these things have to be addressed. Like think about a situation, um, you're, on, you're on a team, you're in a lab, and a couple of your, um, your colleagues are, are fighting with each other and you've gotta get this experiment done. And so the decision is, look, you two just work in separate sections. We gotta get this done. So while in the moment you might've taken care of the behavior that was disrupting some of what needed to be done in the lab, you also still have folks who feel that, wait a minute, what about my needs? What about my perspective? What about what is happening for me? They may be wound up about it and those haven't been addressed either. So if we really wanna work with conflict and resolve it, we have to remember that it's operating on about three different levels. Um, there's generally four types of ways that people tend to respond to conflict. Um, they tend to respond, oh, come along now, passive. Um, so they're, they're doing things like um, not willing to advocate for themselves. So they um, not respond overtly to conflict. 
um, not to express themselves. The challenge for folks who are doing engaging in a passive kind of responding is just because they're not saying it out there and they're not and they're not putting it out there, it is often building up. And sometimes the first time the other person is aware that something has happened is this person has now exploded because things have just built up. They've had a lot of stuff, something in the interaction with you over time, it's been building up, building up, building up, and then it just comes out with a lot of anger. So passive is one type of responding. The aggressive responding, um, which probably you know a lot of you more easily can define, has to do with the dominating and controlling kind of thing, running roughshod over others um, in order to get, it can be described as pushing, threatening, mean, and then uh, the passive aggressive types of things, which is where anger and conflict are expressed, expressed in covert or indirect kind of ways. You know, one of the uh, quotes or phrases that we have is smiling while sabotaging others, somebody behind their back, right? Um, people in this kind of mode of responding, people are resentful about the other, but they won't talk to them about it. They won't engage directly about it. When they do engage, they make it look like it's okay, but in fact, they're engaging in behaviors off the side um, that indicate that they're upset about it. The one we wanna work with, and the one that I find the most helpful is the assertive response. And that's where you advocate for yourself but, and your needs, but you're also advocating in a way that you, you recognize that the other person also has needs and that those needs and those interests are gonna to need to be addressed in order for you to come through this conflict with them in a really constructive kind of way. And this, each of these four has a different kind of energy about them. So you can often have a feel for something like with, when it's somebody is responding passively, you get a sense about disengagement, but also kind of tension, but you're not exactly sure. The aggressive way of responding, you're usually pretty clear about that one, right? It's in your face, it's over top, it's uh, mean. Passive aggressive, again, you might get the sense of confusion, like, I think she's okay with what I said, but gee, I just heard from somebody else. Oh, that's interesting. A diagram just showed up on the, who's writing on my screen? Anybody see that? It's okay if you wanna come off to, thank you. <laughs> uh, and assertive tends to have a much more quiet and focused kind of energy. It tends to be a much more relaxed kind of thing. And when you think about it, that makes sense. If you are engaging with somebody else who's, engaged, who's being assertive as opposed to passive or aggressive or passive aggressive, you do have a sense that they are open to hearing you and what you have to say and that they will also speak for themselves. So I wanted to give you um, um, the STLC system. I mean, there's just so many ways we can talk about conflict, so many suggestions I can make about what to do, but it's always helpful to have a framework, right? I mean, frameworks, you know, acronyms, things to have at your fingertips. So this is one that I particularly like because I think it's pretty clear and I can remember it pretty easily. TLC always makes me, you know, think of tender loving care and S always associated with stop. So it's one that I can try to remind myself of when I'm in the middle of a conflict or when I know I'm coming into a conflict. So there's the stop, the T is for think, um, the L is for listen, you got it. Um, and the uh, C is for communicating. And so when we talk about stopping, one of the things that I've seen with conflict, and you likely have had this experience for yourself, is that um, things seem, sometimes seem to move fast. They just go from zero to 60 and you're like, I don't know where, how did this happen? Where did this go? Or you're in the midst of it and you just, it almost feels like there's a part of you that's out of control on this one and it just keeps going. So one of the first things we need to do is to create the space to slow it down. It doesn't have to go zero through 60. So we need to slow it down. Um, and when we slow it down, then we're able to make more proactive and deliberate and thoughtful choices. Um, now I know that there are times when you're in a situation and it's moving fast and you're like, oh my gosh, I, right now I'm not really ready to engage in this. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I, I, I don't know what's going on. Then we wanna create opportunities to stop the interaction and have the people separate for a while. Um, and you can do that in a number of different ways. It, you can say to some, but you can be very clear with someone and say, you know what, this is a whole lot of information coming to me. 
at one time. And I want to, I want us to work this through. I want to think it through, but I need some time to just take a few deep breaths to settle myself. So I would like us to be able to come back at another time. Now, sometimes people aren't going to cooperate with you and they're not going to say, no, no, you got to stay here. We got to figure this out. It's all going to be done. Um, I think what's really important is you get up and you move. And so I've rarely found it a problem that if I say to somebody, I need to, I need to go use the, the restroom or I need to get a cup of coffee. Do you want a cup of coffee? One of the things that that does is it immediately breaks the interaction, um, gets you moving because that's really important too, because one of the things we see happen when people are in conflict is they start to tense up. And as they tense up, they actually start to breathe very shallowly. So at a time when they need to really have a lot of oxygen stuff moving through their bodies, they're really not doing that, which tends to make it more difficult to think clearly and to make decisions. So getting up and moving can be really helpful. Um, so, you know, be thinking for yourself about ways that you could go about doing that. I'm trying to get my chat screen up here. Um, when you create that space, it's about thinking before you act. So thinking about what are the sources here? Why is, why is this happening? What is my, what is my role here? What if, what's, what's happening for me? What's happening for them? Um, is this about this? Is this about that? We're very curious. We're all in many ways researchers and scientists in the broadest sense of the word. And so we're asking questions. And the other thing to think about is as I engage in this conflict or choose not to engage in, because that's another choice that you have, what do I want out of this? What am I trying to do? Am I trying to solve a problem? Am I wanting to maintain this relationship because it's important to my work or it's important to my life? It's, I care about this person. It's, it's relevant to me. Um, thinking through what some of those goals are. Um, and then listening. Um, this is the th big thing I'm gonna push with you today. And many people who see me present on related types of topics know that this is one of the things that I uh, always say, is that if you only have room in your social skills repertoire for one skill, let it be listening. And we're gonna go through that in detail because I really think it's important that you be able to do this effectively because it'll bring you so much reward in terms of doing it. So before, and I know this is tough when you're in conflict because you got a lot of energy, you got a lot of stuff you want to put out there, you want to make it clear, right? Oh, and so is the other person. And so what I'm going to ask, be asking you to do is to be really disciplined about this and listen to them first open a door and listen to them first. And we're gonna talk about the skills and you're gonna talk about the different kinds of skills involved in doing that. Um, and then communicating, which is you speaking your, your needs. And that's where the assertion stuff comes in. Okay. So what motivates and causes conflict? Um, let me just put that there. I have a YouTube link for you there. I, that's for you. So when you get it in the PowerPoint ha handout, I encourage you to go take a look at that. Um, it's a lovely short video that really goes through details about these different types of sources. I just wanna tap on them briefly, primarily so that you can see that conflicts have a variety of reasons that they occur. And so it's really important for us to understand in any particular conflict situation, what's at play here? What are the issues here? Very often in conflict for people, they will uh, often leap to a personal attribution about the other person, or it has to do with this, when it actually may not have anything to do with that. It may have to do with one of these other kinds of sources. So one of the most easily identifiable ones, doesn't mean it's always easy to solve, is the data conflict. Um, and that's where essentially people disagree or are in conflict and often, and it's, but sometimes it's because they have different interpretation of the information that they have. Now, for those of you who do research, creative activity, you will know that, you know, your data in some ways never speaks for itself. We speak for it. So that interpretation we need to understand. Um, and it feels differently to me if I realize that the conflict I'm having with somebody else is because we have different interpretations of that information, or we're looking at different kinds of information, or we have different ideas about whether that information is relevant or not. Um, that getting clear that that's part of the issue, or it could be the issue, takes away a lot of the intensity, a lot of the emotionality, and so you can tend to focus more on um, what the specific situation is. 
Um, the next one that's again kind of easy to identify, but not necessarily easy to work with is the ones that are the relationship conflicts. Um, and they're the ones where you typically know that's going on when you see people choosing to avoid each other. Uh, or if you've ever gone in, um, you've been in a meeting and you see these people come in and they make a point of never sitting beside each other, they make a point of where there's these awkward silences that go on. So you're picking up on some of the tension there. Other people are picking up on it too. Those ones are, can be particularly challenging, but, they, but when you recognize that it's something that has a history, um, that there's something else that has gone on, then being able to talk about what happened, what are the things that are going on right now in this working relationship? What are the, what are the issues that we have to deal with? Um, the third one has to do with language conflicts. And by this, we mean different kinds of words that people use for different things. So this can also be about having very different languages, right? And we've often said that translating from one language to another often will lose some of the nuance and the cultural embeddedness of something. But getting, making sure you're clear, you're both talking about the same thing, right? Um, so checking out your assumptions. And then the other part is, how is it that we like to communicate around these things? Um, the next one, now these ones become even more challenging to deal with. That doesn't mean impossible. It just means they're, they're quite challenging, is the value conflicts, which are really about things like um, different ways of looking at the world, beliefs, they can be culturally defined, religiously defined, politically defined, uh, that people have different ideas about how the world works, um, what human nature is like, and how we agree with each other, and what are the appropriate kinds of right and wrong kinds of behaviors. And you can usually identify this one when you see the intensity and in people moving to say things are right or they're wrong, um, and they're very much tied to identity. These, uh, these are very challenging because you're not going to know we're not about, we, you're not gonna change somebody's values, all right? Um, what you can do though, is get clear about what they are and get clear yourself about what yours are and have the other person also know that so that we engage with each other and we take an attitude of non-judgment to understand what the assumptions and the beliefs and the values are. And there are times when we come to a conclusion that given those particular values and beliefs and the differences we have on them, us working together may not be a possibility. Other times though, we can find ways to work together while recognizing these kinds of value differences. Uh, one of my favorite stories about that is the Public Conversations Project in Boston, which brought together people who self-identified as being pro-choice or uh, pro-life. And these, uh, these folks have very different values and beliefs about certain things. And what the Public Conversations Project did was say that people are, are complex, and while they can be di on different ends of a continuum in terms of their beliefs and values, there are other places where they connect. So while I can appreciate that you and I are coming from different places, there may still be places that we can work well together. And so in their project, they were able to have folks who self-identified on either end of this continuum be able to have a shared interest in making sure children were taken care of. Okay, so what, what could that look like? We both care about children. We both want them to be taken care of. What kinds of things could we work on together to ensure that children are taken care of? So finding those kinds of places becomes important. The interest conflicts also are particularly challenging. Um, you'll see this show up where people have a zero sum kind of mentality, like in order for me to get what I want, you can't have what you want. There are some situations that are like that, but by far the majority of the situations with, there is a lot of flexibility. And what people enter those situations with is they'll say, I need this, I want this. And often what they're presenting you with is what we call a position. It's a solution to some kind of unmet need. It's a solution to some kind of problem. And same for you. You say, well, I have to have this. So one of the best questions we can ask of each other in that situation is, what does that allow you to do that if it, if it doesn't happen, you can't do? Be asking the questions, why? What underlies, what is that a solution for? And one of the things we find is as we peel that back and get down to what are the actual needs here, now a number of possible solutions and ways to mutually address these needs start to occur. 
So we really have to dig down a little bit deeper on that one. And then the last one, but certainly not least, and probably one of the most challenging one is the structural conflicts. And you know you're in one of those because the system or the structure of a group, of a team, of an organization, of a society is set up in a way that is pretty much invisible. But some people have more power than other people, or we have lack of clarity about how we can participate in this. Um, and we have assumptions about it. And so part of what we do with uh, situations like that is to engage with each other, to examine how this system has set up and positioned us in particular ways. And therefore, what can we do to work together on that particular issue? Complex stuff, I know. I wanted just to introduce it to you because to illustrate to you that there are lots of different reasons why we have conflicts. And it's not just because the person on the other side is being ridiculous or a pain in the or mean and nasty. People are pretty rational. They may, we need to, we need to figure out and you need to figure out for yourself why this matters to you. And so this core skills that we use, um, sorry guys, I just want to check my time. Yeah, I'm doing okay. Um, so breaking it down, how do you do this stuff? What do you do? And there's a fourth core skill model that I'd like to use. Um, the first is uh, the four core skills that you need to develop. And many of you have this already. You may not trust yourselves that you have this, but you've used them in different circumstances, is listening, assertion, problem solving. And then those three come together in a conflict management model. And the challenge for you to know at any point in time is which of those skills do you need at that moment? So what we're going to... so. One of the ways that I like to think about it is to think about it in terms of energy levels and where we are in terms of our emotional energy. So for example, in the first pairing there, you see if we, if we read the red color as the amount of emotional energy somebody has with regard to this particular situation. And the first one, there's you, you've got a moderate amount of energy, which means, hey, I can, I'm gonna pay attention here. It feels important to me and I want to do something about it. The other person's got a lot of energy around it and really needs to be working with that. In thinking about that situation, you can put it in the chat, which skill do you think? Listening, assertion, problem solving, or conflict management, the three of them together do you need? Oh, somebody wants to go back to the previous. Oh, you want to? <laughs> Shayna, you want me to go back to the previous one? Was it okay that I just repeated what the four skills were? Is that okay? Listening, listening, okay. And Shayna, you're probably asking me to do something that my sophistication level is rather questionable. Yeah, I'm sorry, Shayna. I'll tell you what, Shayna, follow up with me and I'll help you with that. So we're getting list. Oh, thanks, Shayna. That's very kind of you. I appreciate that. Okay, so we're hearing listening. Ta da! Good work. Good work, right? Somebody else has a lot of energy around it. You've got enough energy to engage, but you're not overwhelmed. That's a really great place for you to be turning on the energy to listen to other people. Now, how about the second one? Um, yeah, uh, how about the second one? Now, you're full up with it. You've got a lot that you need to say. And the other person has enough energy that they're orienting to you and they want to pay attention to what you have to say. Which of the skills, now we've knocked off listening, so now you're knowing where I'm going with some of this. The three remaining skills we have are assertion, problem solving, and conflict management. Which one do you think is reflected here? And you can just throw it in the chat, yeah. Oh, look at you guys, you guys are awesome. Look at that, woohoo, you're right, assertion. Now, good job. So. The other person's in a place where they can hear you and they want to engage and you've got things that you need to say. Good work. Now let's think about this one. Both of you are full up. Both of you have a lot of energy. Which of the two remaining sets of skills do you think are needed here? Problem solving or conflict management? Conflict management, Louis saying problem solving. Anybody else? Conflict management, conflict management, yeah. Yeah, it's actually, it is, it's conflict management. Um, because we're gonna do a combination of listening and assertion to get things down so that both parties are at a level where they can engage, which is our next set right here. 
And if we're successful in accomplishing that for both the parties, then people can actually are, have enough energy to engage with each other and to stay with each other and to think cl more clearly about, okay, so what are the issues in front of us and what are some strategies that we have? Good work, you guys. See, you know this stuff, right? You absolutely know this stuff. So, but a lot of people have different ideas about what listening is. And so I'm gonna share with you the three types that we often talk about. One is the compet competitive or combative listening. So this is the one where you're talking to me and, and I'm listening, but the whole time in my head, I'm going, just wait, just wait till so-and-so is finished on, oh, that's the point I'm gonna go after. I'll wait until they're finished and then I'm gonna go after that, right? So it's a much more interested in it, in that circumstance, I'm listening to support my point of view or to create the opportunity for me to go in and say how it really is. So um, that's, a, that's a very frustrating situation to be in. You may well have been on the receiving end of that, but you probably also have been on the end of the giving of it. And then there's what we call the passive or attentive listening, which is really a nice form of listening. And you do really want to hear the other person's perspective. You're calm, you're focused, you're doing all of the good following and attending behaviors, that type of thing. But you assume that you understand what they're saying, and maybe you do, but you're not communicating back to them what you understood. So sometimes I'll use the phrase, hey, I've been doing this work for like a long, long, long time, and I will still do this where somebody will be talking to me and I'll go, I understand. Maybe I do, but they don't know what it is that I understand. The best way I can let them know what it is I understand is to engage in active listening or reflect, well, another term they use is reflective listening, which is that I verify with the other person what I heard them say. Um, so it might be things like, it sounds like that was a very difficult situation for you and you feel like you were at loose ends. Is that right? And you might come back and say, yes, I went for the yes on that one because I'm sharing with somebody what I think I heard them say. If they say yes, then I know I'm on the right track with them. I'm getting in their headspace. If they say not, nah, well, not really, then I invite them to say a little bit more. I believe that this is the single most important skill you will ever develop, ever. Um, and so I believe that. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. So in the chat, why would I think, or why hopefully would you think that active listening is a good thing? Like what happens when you actively listen to someone else? Tell me what happens. Tell me what happens when you're actively listened to or when you've done that for somebody else. What, what do you see? What, what's, what happens? Yep, respect for the other person, validate their thoughts. And, oh yeah, engage, learn, yeah. Helps us value each other, but even though we're in conflict, absolutely. Understanding, this is such a good point. The other person has information that you do not have. How they think about things, what they care about, um, helps develop more information. You guys are great. This is a great chat, look at all that. Person feels respected, it's affirming. Oh yeah, learn, you learn things, right? You learn, and from that learning, you get more insight into them, but you also get potentially some insight into yourself, right? As you go about doing that. You guys, you guys are pretty amazing, you know that? So it indicates readiness to learn, that's right. It communicates to people, I'm here, and I'm actually open to this. I'm not just pretending I'm listening. I'm not just getting ready to fight you on this or to argue with you on this, or to hope you'll finish soon so I can go do something else, right? Um, and you guys have done a great job clearing up understanding, gathering information, identifying areas where you might agree, but also where you disagree or where there's a gap. Remember, I gave that example about um, some of the data conflicts or the language conflicts where it start, you kind of go, you're talking about this, right? And you talk about what, yeah, I'm talking about this. And the other person goes, oh, okay, well, that's different. What, so let's figure out what we're talking about. Um, it helps the other person clarify their thoughts and feelings. This is really an important one <laughs> because even when somebody comes prepared to talk to you about a conflict or you to talk to them, 
they're still working through things. And so when you, as you create the space with the listening, that's giving them space to kind of lay out the stuff and go, oh, okay, some of, hmm, okay, I have a different idea about that now. Um, others, you talked about this too, others being heard and acknowledged, and then they're open. When people feel, genuinely feel that you're listening to them, they will be more receptive and more open to you. And it creates a sense of respect and caring. Again, these are all things that you identified. So you know how important this is. And I love this quote, um, you can show the most sincere forms of respect is by truly listening to what another person has to say, because it takes your time, it takes your focus, it takes your energy to do that. And that's a communication of, of commitment. And it's very calming in tough situations. One of the things that I've found for myself, and I've asked other people about this, is that when you actively listen to somebody else, I can't be doing anything else. I, I need to be focused on you. I need to be listening to what you're saying. I need to work to understand. I need to share that back with you to see if am I on the right track? Am I with you on that? Did I get it right? That kind of thing. That whole time I'm doing that, there's no energy for me to be feeding the little homunculus in the back of my brain going, just wait till she's done or just wait till they're done. And I'm going to go after them. And I'm, it actually allows you to calm down. It's really kind of amazing what happens. And I hope some of you have had that kind of experience. So it cools you out. Now, let me just check the times. Yeah, I, I really want to do this exercise, you guys. And it's a relatively short one. And you've got the um, uh, handout on how to do this. Um, Nick generously has agreed to put you into breakout rooms of three. And what's going to happen here is you very quickly need to identify who's going to be a speaker, who's going to be a listener, and who's going to be the observer. And speaker, you're going to speak about something you have energy about, that you care about. I'm not asking you to have a fight with the listener, but talk about something that has meaning for you. And listener, uh, let me go to observer first. Observer, you're going to watch speaker and listener and see what it is the listener is doing or not doing, okay? And just kind of keep track of that a little bit. Listener, you get two shots at this. The first time you do it, I want you to be the worst listener you have ever been. The worst. Communicating that you're not listening, you're not following, whatever, you know, all of that. Um, we are only going to do that. And observer, we need your help with this. Don't let them go on more than 30 to 45 seconds. Because if any of you can recall from your own experience, when you are not listened to, when you feel like the other person is not listening to you, you get really frustrated, the energy goes up and things start to expand, okay? And we don't want to have bad feelings about this. We know it's a role play, but, um, and then to spend a few moments talking about listeners saying what you did to try to communicate that you weren't being good at this, <laughs> um, speaker sharing whatever they have to say, and then we'll do the flip. And now listener, you get a chance to redeem yourself. You're gonna be the best possible listener you can be. And I do that for a little bit, little while, again, 30 to 45 seconds, talk together about what were the things the listener was doing or not doing that communicated that they were uh, living well. Does that make sense? Okay, uh, Amna, thank you. Just to let you all know too, um... You know, if anybody else has to drop off right now, please go ahead. But I'm going to, once I set, I'm going to set these up shortly and you'll be automatically assigned. They'll be out. You'll be in there for five minutes and then it will automatically bring you back. Um, there should be a short countdown um, right beforehand. I'm sure most of you have dealt with this before. Um, so I'm going to give up just one more second here because I know, you know, I want to make, make sure everybody has an opportunity here. Um, and we will go ahead we're going to go with, um, we're just going to go with 11 rooms. And so uh, best of luck, everybody. We'll all still be here. Laura Lee and Laura Lee and Mary, you may both be assigned to a room, but. Oh, um, okay. This <laughs> um, is kind of exciting. I'm not sure if you will or not, but um, <laughs> all right. I'm going to go ahead and set these up uh, now.
Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody, and thanks for coming back. So let's have a little bit of a chat on this one. So let me open up my chat. Um, so tell me, um, so for the folks who were observers, what was the listener, let's talk about poor listening. What was the listener doing or not doing that was communicating that they weren't really listening to the other person? And you can also come off mute if you like. Okay, I'm going down the chat here. Here we go. Anybody want to come out? Anybody want to speak? <laughs> I would say, this is what I would say. When you actually talk, you bring your subject up. But then after you give this long speech, you uh, ask a question to the person and they say, you're talking about uh, blah, 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 blah. And I'm thinking, yeah, I focus my time on this. And, and apparently poor listening, you forget every single thing that the person said and you, and it, it's just this rude, very rude um, thought in your head. You're saying, oh, this person has to give a crap about what I just said. Why would I even bother myself with this person anymore? Yeah. So you're, what you did as a listener is focus on your needs as opposed to what they were telling you. Like, yeah. you said, okay, I'm hearing enough, but I want to give you my opinion on that. Right. And at some point you may want to give your opinion, but what we're doing right now is really listening. So thank yes. you. Mm -hmm. how, how about others? What other things did people do or not do to communicate that they weren't, they weren't being very good at listening? You were all great listeners. Oh yeah. Todd, go ahead. Um, so uh, facial expressions was a big part of uh, our interaction and made it clear, the listener made it clear that um, they were skeptical and not really listening. Right, right. And that's a particular, you know, I was thinking about this in the challenge that we have faced over the last couple of years where much of our contact with each other has been in video, right? And so a lot of the stuff that we would use in person with each other doesn't always come across as clearly. So um, that's where things like the head nods are really important because they encourage people to keep talking. One of the challenges that are off, we often have in video is that maybe some of ours have a setup where our camera's over here. So we're looking there, but you're actually looking at me, but I can't see you really looking at me. And so it feels kind of odd. So um, there are a number of issues that we run into. Oh, Kim's got her hand up. Kim, what would you like to say? Hello, can you hear me? I can. I actually have a question okay. regarding that topic. Okay. Um, I'm one of those people where my nonverbals never match my verbals. So okay. I can be saying one thing, but my nonverbals are communicating something totally different. And so mm -hmm. where the conflict is a specific topic, now that specific topic has now escalated because the person is focusing on my nonverbals, which is communicating something different. Right. So now I come across as being disingenuous. So Yes. You know, it's like, then I learned from that mistake and I try to do the nonverbal that I learned in the last conflict, which doesn't work with the next person because that non-conflict, I mean, that nonverbal means right. something else to that person. Yep. So yep. you're nodding your head. Like, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. Nonverbals get me in trouble. Oh, yeah. And so now I go with the blank look because I don't know what to do because I'm paralyzed. I and know. so now that creates a whole nother conflict. So how do you handle the nonverbals? Because yeah. nonverbals mean something different to everybody, right. depending on their subcultures, their, their mm -hmm. actual culture, you know, mm -hmm. regions, demographics. So how mm -hmm. do you handle that is my question. Well, first of all, Kim, let me, if you were looking in the chat, other people are going, yeah, I hear that. I know what that's like. And another piece is before I answer very directly your question, nonverbals and verbals, if they tend to conflict with each other, people pay attention to the nonverbals. And actually the nonverbals are very informative. So part of it is thinking about what that, you know, when you use those particular nonverbals or somebody else does, what does that mean? And that's the point for me that I hear you raising, Kim, is, you know, how do you do that when people have different kinds of nonverbals? That actually becomes one of the questions or the issues that you, you deal with with other people. Like, 
uh, I could say to Todd, um, it, as Todd's listening to me or something, and, and I see it and I say, Todd, um, I'm looking at you and you, you seem to be, you seem to have an expression on your face that suggests that you're bored with what I'm saying. Is that, is that right? And now it's Todd's chance to clarify that, right? So, and one of the Absolutely things- Absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Todd. Now I have a better understanding. Um, but that's actually one of the things that we do with each other in our relationships is we have to, in many ways, negotiate with each other how it is that we we have our conflicts with each other. So Kim, you and I might have a very different sort of framing of our conflicts. I have a very expressive face. I've had to learn how to school it because, you know, I can show surprise, like my eyes go whoop like that. And that may not be what I want to communicate to somebody at that time, that particular person, but somebody else it might work. And so part of that getting to know each other is getting to learn that about each other and, and having explicit conversations about it. Is that at all helpful, Kim? And, hmm. Maybe. And, Yes and no. Yes and okay. no. It, it does, but it doesn't. And I don't know if it's just the subculture that I'm a part of. Mm. Um, yeah, I think it's I, important I, I guess because of, I, I, I don't want to come across like therapeutic. You know what I'm saying? Like it seems <laughs> like people is like, man, I feel like you giving me some form of therapy session because I would literally come out and say, I'm explaining to you what it is that I'm saying. What is it that you need from me? Right. Like I literally, I, I'm, I'm one of those type of people because I'm not a mind reader. So I would literally ask the person, what mm -hmm. is it that you need from me mm -hmm. to help you to understand the message that I'm trying to convey to you? Yeah. Well, when I do that, they feel like I think that they're stupid or, you know what I'm saying? So it, I, I get myself in these quicksand situations where I'm just like to hell with it whatever yeah. and I walk away so that's why I'm saying no yes but no you know yeah. what I'm saying yeah that's why I'm saying yes but no but I get your point is what I'm saying I, I do get your point I do understand what it is that you're saying and I, I don't know maybe my conflicts is a little bit more in depth in this particular workshop <laughs> I, first of all, I don't think you're alone. So just check out the chat. You're not alone. And this is, off, this is often an issue that people have with each other is trying to find out how it is, basically how we're going to fight with each other. So I like to say, and people have different ways in which they go about doing it. Some folks are much more direct. Um, some folks are less direct about it. Neither one of those is necessarily better than the other, but it's about learning about somebody else and getting used to them. And that takes time to do that. Um, and so, and sometimes the conflict is because I'm reading the nonverbals wrong, right? So it's not that I'm being obtuse or ridiculous. I'm making an assumption that when I see these particular kinds of nonverbals from you, it means you're this. Um, but what I want people to do is slow down and say, okay, so what am I responding to here? And what is it I know? And what is it I don't know? So with the you know, very minor example I gave with Todd, um, it was saying, okay, I don't know why Todd's expression looks like that, but I want to tell him what it looks like to me and ask him if that's accurate. And if it's not, then Todd has the opportunity to be able to change that. He, he has the opportunity to be able to say, no, actually, I'm very interested in what you're saying. Uh, this, is my, this is my rested interesting face, you know, that kind of thing. Hey, and I see, oh gosh, thank you. Guys, you. Clock. You're welcome, Kim. If you want to talk more, um, just email me and we can have a wee chat. I see S. McCall has her hand up and it's after four. So I understand if a lot of you have to go, right? Um, I'm, in the, I'm in the Wayne system. So if you want to fire some questions at me or something like that, I'm happy to do something. And I'll talk to uh, Mary and Nick about the possibility about trying to develop something else in addition to this to share with you, to, to share with you. And the PowerPoint that I've got, I will make sure the notes pages are rich with information and interpretation for you. Okay, so S. McCall. Well, first off, thank you. This has been really great. Um, my question is kind of a two-parter. Okay. Um, kind of piggyback offing the, the discrepancy between verbal and nonverbal. Um, to get clarity on both of those things, obviously you don't want to ask them at the same time. Is mm -hmm. it more appropriate, one, to 
ask one before the other and if so which one and then i guess my second part of the question is is how much um does emotional intelligence play mm -hmm. into conflict resolution conflict management um relative to this okay two really meaty questions um, I would say I don't have a particular order about verbal or nonverbal, but um, whatever you're responding to most immediately is probably the one you want to bring up. Or the discrepancy, right? Because that's often what cues people. Um, you know, you said you're interested. Let's have this conversation because I really want to understand what you're telling me. And then as I'm talking, your face is is not giving me what I th think I would like, right? Or what I need. And so that now becomes in this moment, the issue that you need to be talking about. And so saying that, saying, you know, I really appreciate um, that you're willing to um, try to understand where I'm coming from on this, because that's really important. Um, as I'm, you know, as I'm sharing, I'm looking at your face and your face looks like you don't have any expression. I can't see an expression in your face or your eyes, or you, you seem to be annoyed because you're frowning, right? Um, and I've heard the frowning one a few times because um, being intensely focused on the camera, sometimes it comes across as a frown. So then you and I work that out. So I provide you with information that would say things like, oh, I didn't know that I was coming across as frowning. That's certainly not what I wanted to communicate. That's actually my intense gaze. So, um, but let me tell you what, I, what I've heard you say so far, and you can tell me if I'm on track with you. So that then we get that cleared up and then we can start going back into the other issue. Does that make some sense? Yes, absolutely. So it's kind of like you're resolving a conflict within a conflict. <laughs> absolutely, man. I mean, conflicts are so fascinating because they can start in one place and then as you're working on it, other stuff can come in. I'm not necessarily talking about the kitchen sink approach where you're mad at somebody and so you bring in everything they've ever done wrong and you throw it at them. But in the process of talking with each other, in the process of figuring this out, other things might become clear so that actually some issues then drop away because as soon as I explain to uh, you, know, you give me your perspective, I share back what I heard from you and you say, okay, and then you're, now you're ready to hear mine and we put both of ours out and we go, oh, we actually agree. So then we're done with that. But yeah, they can be very uh, living kinds of situations. Now you asked about emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is a set of, is a set of skills that people can develop. Um, and people develop them in lots of different circumstances, right? So people who are more skilled at that might find dealing in conflicts initially quite a bit easier, but conflicts truthfully are challenging. I mean, I've been doing this work for a long, long, long time. And I still sometimes get that feeling in the pit of my stomach. Um, and that's why I like the, let me bring it around, the STLC model, because it's one of the things I remind myself of is, okay, I got to stop, I got to slow it down, got to give myself some space, I need to think about what I want to have happen. I need to, and when in doubt, I always say, when in doubt, listen to what the other, listen, like turn the ears on, genuinely listen to where the other person is coming from and communicate what you think you've heard them say. And don't worry if you make a mistake. That's why, or that's why you share it back. It gives them an opportunity to say, mm, no, not it. That's not it. So you can open the door some more and they can give you some more. And it may be because they're describing it in a way that, you know, they're kind of all over the place. And it may be because you're kind of in a different place and having trouble doing that. But yeah, it's a lot of back and forth, um, periodically stepping in and having some kind of summarizing on it. Like, okay, let's, we've covered a lot of territory. Let's, can we just talk about what we've covered so far? So we've agreed, or we have a sense that um, the issue about when things start is really important and that we have different ideas about that. And so going through those kinds of pieces and those summary kinds of things can be a way of giving people a chance to breathe and kind of go, okay, yeah, yeah. Those are some of the things that we're trying to deal with. Does that help? Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, I mean, it's helpful, especially, I mean, when dealing with neuroatypical individuals. Oh, yes. Too. Yep. Absolutely. You know what, anybody else? I mean, I've got, to, it's 408. I don't wanna keep you unless you, anybody else got any particularly pressing questions? And I promise I'm gonna make that PowerPoint in the notes page is really rich. So it's the next best thing to being with me. 
Anybody else got anything that I, I got a few more minutes if you do. So Loralee, are we, can we share your contact information in the thank you email? Oh, now? totally. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Absolutely. Yes, we'll I do that to as well. Out to you. Okay. Yeah, that would be great, Kim. Go for it. And anybody yeah, I, else too. Anybody I else? I know from experience, Loralee is, is very good at, at, very fast to respond to emails. <laughs> no conflict there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but we could have other kinds. It could be fun. <laughs> Anything else from anybody? Well, let me, um, you know, we were just actually these examples that people were asking with, with their questions. What you saw there was a combination of listening, active listening. So sharing back what I heard somebody say or what I think I heard them say so they can correct me. Um, and then providing my thoughts on that. So that's the assertion piece of it. Where I describe where you need to describe very specifically what it is you're responding to, the impact that it's had on you, um, you know your feelings about it, and how you want to, you know, and what it is you want differently. So that's the assertion part of it. But that's in the PowerPoint. I will make sure to go through that, um, and we can talk about that some more. All Anything right. else? Will we get a copy of your PowerPoint? Yes, you will, ma'am. I'm going to um, augment the notes pages. Um, and you also got a handout from me on uh, quick tips. That's a lovely little summary of things, but I've got a ton of stuff and I'm happy to share it. So I'll make sure each slide has something in the note page that describes the key points and what the intention of them was. Yeah, we, we included the tips in the um, email that you would have received just before um, three o'clock today, but we'll also include it in the thank you email just so that That's you right. see it again. Um, in case you didn't catch it last time. Mm -hmm. So, well, thank, thank you, Orly, so much. Hey, uh, you're this, welcome. This has been a really, really engaged and lively group. One of you know, one you know of the more engaged to, groups we've had in a while. So, what I look forward to is when we can actually be in the same physical space. Um, that will have a different energy around it. Um, and like we can do some unique things here, we can do some unique things when we're together too. Excellent. Okay. Thanks everybody. And again, if you need to contact me, please feel free to do so. Well, thank Bye. you so much, Loralee. This has been a You're great welcome. event. Thank you everybody. Again, we'll share the video um, when we send out the thank you email along with all, the, all of these resources. Um, be sure to also take the survey. We'll be sending that out as well. Um, and that's about it here. Um, make sure to check out the graduate school website. Make sure to check out the PDS web page for all of our upcoming events. Laura Lee will be back for conflict, uh, <laughs> conflict management part two coming up later this semester. Um, and so that will be, you know, it's a different program. It's not the exact same, um, but, you know, by all means, if you, if you want to go, um, yep. you know, if, you, if you're happy to check it out again, you can for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, that concludes our session here today. So thanks, especially to everybody who stuck around past the uh, four oh, o'clock yeah. hour. You know, it's yeah. like two weeks in a row that we've gone gone over thanks to um, all these questions. So, um, you know, without without um, without all of you, these events would not be as successful as they are. So, thanks again, everybody. And Bye, uh, everybody. And we will see you next time. Yeah. Mama, I appreciate it.